So I've changed a little bit the title, actually. I've, I've added, uh, oh, where is that? Non-coding RNAs in the, in the story. So we'll start with a, a, a general view of what is epigenetics. For those of you who don't know, essentially mathematicians, I guess, are not very familiar with the concept. So let's start with genetics. Uh, you, of course, know about um, Mendelian uh, transmission and genetics. You heard about it this morning. Genetics laws allow the same phenotype with different genotypes. For example, when you have a recessive inheritance of a trait. But genetics, if you take it basically, does not predict different phenotypes with the same genotype. However, it's been known for a very long time, actually, that there are many cases of identical genotypes and different phenotypes, which says that genetics cannot explain everything. So I just give you a few examples of that. For example, the queen of the bees and the workers are generated from identical larvae. But they have very different phenotypes, as you can see here, and as you may know. Another example, which is closer to us, is the cells from a, a, a single organism. All the cells from a complex organism come from a single cell. They have an identical genotype, as, as far as we can say. Uh, but, so, uh, uh, so they come from uh, uh, the same cells originally, and then they become quite different when uh, uh, we, 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 we are with an embryo. And you have completely different cells, brain, muscle, gut. All these cells have the same genotype, but they have different phenotypes. This, <coughs> so the question, which has actually uh, been on for a long time, but it's solved now, is how these cells can have the same genotype but completely different geno uh, phenotype. And the answer comes from epigenetics. Now, the modern definition of epigenetics is the analysis of stable and reversible changes in gene expression that do not involve modification of genetic information. And how is, can this happen at the molecular level? So you know that genetic information is bound by DNA, and it's located in the cell nucleus, in blue here in, in this picture. But DNA is not naked. In fact, in a human cell, in a human cell nucleus, there is, uh, which, which has about 10 micrometer of diameter, there is about two meters of DNA. So this very small nucleus cannot accommodate these two met meters of DNA without compaction. And in fact, uh, DNA is compacted in the cells. I apologize for resolution, which comes from the change of computer, I guess. Uh, so you have the naked form of the DNA, and then several degrees of compaction up to the most compacted form, which is the, the um, mitotic chromosome. Now this compaction, in fact, is due to uh, proteins, which are called the histone. So you have several of them. We are not going to go into the details here. But you have two rounds of DNAs, uh, uh, which are, is wrapped around the core of histone proteins and with a regular uh, disposition. So these are called the nucleosomes. And the nucleosomes, so this is the, the chain of nucleosomes, and then this chain can be compacted, and then the new chain is compacted again, and so you have different, different level of compaction. Now the problem is that compacted chromatin, in the compacted chromatin, the DNA is not accessible for proteic cellular machineries. So that, and, and, and if you want to express a gene, you have to have access to the DNA 
to uh, uh, the, the RNA, trans the transcription machineries, the RNA synthesizing machinery. So that in fact, compacted chromatin is linked to, to inactive gene and open chromatin, decompacted chromatin, are potentially active genes. And indeed, if you look at the uh, uh, cell nucleus, you have different degree of compaction that you can even see by electronic uh, microscopy. And you can distinguish what is called euchromatin, which is little compacted and which includes active genes, from heterochromatin, which is highly compact and which includes inactive genes. Now, chromatin compaction is controlled by chemical modifications of the chromatin. The DNA can be modified, it can, it's methylated, and the histones, the proteins on which it is wrapped, can also be modified. They have little tails protruding out of the nucleosome, which can be either acetylated, methylated, phosphorylated, and you have all sorts of different combinations of all these uh, modifications of the histone tails. So that, and, and the, these modifications, these combinations of modifications are specific of the uh, different uh, type of chromatins. In uh, heterochromatin, the highly compacted uh, chromatin, inactive chromatin, uh, DNA is methylated, histones are deacetylated, and you have um, methylation on certain residue of, of the histone tail, for example, HVK9. In contrast, when chromatin is active in euchromatin, you have demethylated DNA, histones are acetylated, and they are methylated on other residues, such as uh, H3K4, for example. You can actually uh, measure at the whole genome level these modifications, one by one, and this will give you the epigenome of the cell. Now, if you take the genome as a book, the epigenome will tell you which are the open pages. It's the epigenetic marks which will select the open pages of the book. So this, if, if you want, is the euchromatin, you can read it. This is the heterochromatin. You cannot read it. So if we come back to the question of the cells which come from a single cell and have a, an identical phenotype, actually the difference is, uh, at least in large part, due to the epigenome, because their epigenome is different. So if you take a stem cell, for example, you will have the genes A, B, and C, which are methylated, uh, etc., and compacted. Whereas if you take its daughter cell, it's the other genes will be methylated, compacted, etc. So the pattern of genes which are open and the pattern of genes which are uh, closed are different between uh, these two cells. So the main question appears to be solved. We know what makes a different phenotype from a single genotype. But there are all other open questions. One of the, the question, which is very important actually, is can epigenome be modified by external signal? It's a socially important question because it includes the relationship between the genome and the environment. And you know uh, all these uh, problems created by uh, the environment. Well, we know that external signals can modify the epigenome. Like you have a ligand, for example, which will bind to a receptor activates a chain of transduction and eventually <coughs> will change the chromatin very locally at very specific loci from compacted to open and will activate the gene. Uh, at a more organism level, if we come back to the B uh, model, it's in fact an external signal which is the royal nectar with which the queen is fed, which makes the whole difference between the worker and the queen. 
it is the, 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 the fact that it, the queen is fed with this type of food, which modifies the epigenome of the larvae and makes a queen. And it has been proven that some genes are methylated in the absence of royal nectar, and this will give a worker, whereas other genes uh, will be activated by the royal nectar. And these genes control the size, ovary activity, etc., of the uh, future bee. Uh, in mammalians also, we have many examples of effect of an external signal on uh, the epigenome. Here, for example, is the example of the, these mice, which are born from a stressed mother. So when the, when the mouse is pregnant, you stress it by noise, different noises or stuff like that. Now the mouse, which are, are born from a mother that are stressed during preg pregnancy, are themselves stressed. Uh, whereas the mouse, which is born from a, a well-treated mother, is not stressed and it has been linked to the methylation of the gene which is a gene which is expressed in the neurons and, and, and which actually defects is associated with schizophrenia and uh, the mouse born from the stressed mother this, this gene is methylated whereas in the mouse born well, uh, from a well-treated mother the gene is not methylated so it's expressed. So it is clear environment, nutrition, external conditions affect the epigenome. Now another very important question, and this one is not solved at all, is can epigenome modifications be transmitted to the next generations? Now if we take a somatic cell, like for example we have a culture, uh, uh, let's say fibroblast, so differentiated cells, then all the daughter cells of this fibroblast will be fibroblasts, which clearly indicates that the epigenome is transmitted from the mother cell to the daughter cells. Despite the fact, and I think it's a very interesting question actually, that during the mitosis, the chromosomes are highly condensed. It's the most condensed form of the chromosome. So, and despite this fact, they, they keep, they maintain this information. And actually, we don't know how. Uh, but now if we take uh, not the somatic cells, but the germ cells, is uh, the epigenome transmitted to the descendant? Well, there are actually uh, numerous studies in mouse and human suggesting that it might be the case. And if we go back to the stressed mice, actually, the mice which are born from a stressed mothers, they are stressed, but they ha also have a good probability of giving themselves birth to stressed descendants, raising the possibility that if this uh, epigenomic uh, st uh, status or feature has been transmitted. And there are numerous studies like that in the literature. However, this is a very controversial issue. Uh, as actually these experiments are very difficult to interpret, is the effect due to molecular transmission of the epigenome to the embryo in the germ cells? Or is it due to cultural factors and behavioral transmission? The stressed mother is stressed. She deals with uh, it, or it deals if it's a mouse, uh, with her. <laughs> um, infants in a very specific way. Metabolic factor, stress, so there are particular hormones there. They exactly, so it, it can be, it can stress be. Stress is chemical, don't you? Right? The, the stress is chemical, but it's, but the, 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 the way. Sure, but the way that the children receive the stress, it will induce a chemical reaction in them as well. No, no, but, but it's the no, transmission no, no. is. What's an embryo will receive its hormones? And who cares what he will see chemic afterwards? Yes, but if it gives birth, if it gives birth, okay, the, the same embryo will give it birth. Keeps chemical signature. It keeps chemical signature, not behavior. Well, we'll see that it cannot keep, keep this chemical signature, at least not at the epigenomic level, because if we move directly to the next 
slide, actually the epigenetic marks are erased during development. They are erased, almost completely erased. So you can always say that maybe the almost is the fact that, but it, it cannot be really. Um, <coughs> So this is the... It was a chemistry in the blood of mother. They erase here, but then yeah. during development, this chemistry of the mother... Yeah, but that, that, that is okay for the... No, but that is okay for the first generation. No, no, but I see, I see what Misha is saying. This is okay for the first generation, but it's not okay for the second or sometimes the third generation. You know? Um, <coughs> okay, so I, I, at a very important stage, so here are, for example, the methylation marks. So you had the DNA from the mother and from the, fa from the father, so it's methylated here. And then, at a very important stage, which is actually the stage where the embryo appears, and the, the ap appearance of the embryonic stem cells, then almost everything is erased. So the epigenetic marks are lost. And then they reappear, and you have differentiation of the, of the, of the cells. So how could the marks be transmitted if they are erased during uh, the development. This is a completely unsolved issue at this point. But you can ask the question, are the epigenetic marks the only players? Or are there other players involved? At the genomic level, of course. And good candidates are non-coding RNAs. Non-coding RNAs are transcribed from the non-coding genome. So it means that they don't have any open reading frame to make proteins. Uh, previously, uh, the non-coding genome was called junk DNA uh, because uh, it was thought that it, it, uh, it is absolutely useless. Uh, now it's uh, rather called the dark genome. Why? In fact, the complexity of organisms is not correlated with the gene numbers. So if we take, for example, C. elegans, uh, which has uh, 90 or, or not far from 20,000 genes, it's a, it's a little worm, uh, which, is uh, which has very little complexity, very little complexity, and very small, it's a very small animal as well. It's a, and if you compare that to human, Human is thought to, to have about 24,000 genes. So you have very little differences in the number of genes. So the complexity of an organism is not linked to the number of genes. However, it's, it is inversely correlated with the percentage of uh, coding sequences. The less coding sequences you have, the more complex the organism is, and in fact, uh, in human, it's 97% of the genome which is non-coding. The, all the proteinome that you heard about this morning represents only 3% of the genome. The rest is non-coding. So if you take, for example, this, this could be a human chromosome. Well, the coding part is here in red, and all the rest is non-coding. So for long, this non-coding uh, genome has been of no interest at all. Again, it was called the, gene, uh, the, the junk DNA. And then the discovery of small non-coding RNAs triggered the interest for the non-coding genome. So the non-coding RNAs are the microRNAs that I'm sure you heard about many times. So they are, it doesn't work. Well, they've been discovered in C. elegans and uh, they, they are very small RNA sequences which bind to uh, the messenger RNA and uh, prevents the uh, synthesis of protein, the translation of the messenger RNA. But small non-coding RNAs uh, represent a very small part of the non-coding genome. They are very short and there are a few thousand of them, so they don't represent the whole thing. Now we know that actually almost all the genome, it's even more than 70% now, uh, of the genome is transcribed. We know that thanks to the, these new uh, sequencing technologies which allow to see 
molecules which are very little represented in a population because what they do, the, what we do in this technology is that we sequence mo one molecule, the molecules one by one. So if you do enough molecules, if you have a molecule which is very little represented, you can see it. And because of course the, 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 the whole, um, the transcription of the whole genome does not give rise to very uh, f um, frequent RNAs. It's been totally ignored up to now. But now we know that uh, almost all the genome is transcribed and it's mostly transcribed in uh, long non-coding RNAs. And we actually know that long non-coding RNAs are able to modify the epigenome. It's been long, known for very long that there is a non-coding RNA, which is called XIST, which covers one of the X chromosomes in somatic cells of mammalian females, uh, resulting in the epigenetic silencing of the anti-chromosome. You know that you have to have uh, gene dosage on the X chromosome uh, so that uh, male and female have the same level of expression of the genes which are in the X uh, chromosome. So there are di in nature there are different ways to achieve that and in mammalian cells uh, one of the X chromosome is inactivated and it's inactivated thanks to this long non-coding RNA, although the precise mechanism is uh, not known. Do you know that, is it known whether every single one of those X. bits of, uh, uh, of RNA are actually functional? No, of course not, not yet. How would you determine that? Well, it's, a, it, it, it's really starting now. It's been started for, uh, I would say, uh, five years now. Uh, what you do is, you, you as usual, uh, to analyze the function, you, you kill the, the, the molecule. No, but you have... 70% of the genome is... It's even more than that. Oh. Well, whatever, it, and you just said it's 70%, right? Yeah. <coughs> so how are you going to walk through 70% of the genome and eliminate every single one? That, that's insane. Well, you will have to do, <laughs> you will have to do that. Uh, because there is no way that you can do a cell with only the, 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 <laughs> the 3% of DNA. <laughs> so... How would you test, how one would test that? What, well, what people are doing right now is that they are looking at specific long non-coding RNAs which are differentially expressed in this or that situation in uh, uh, healthy cells versus uh, whatever, okay, uh, whatever disease or cancer or whatever. And then they look in, into these differentially expressed. Uh, I think it's a little bit like what was done with the genes at the beginning, you know. At the beginning people looked at one gene you know, which is differently, uh, blah, blah, and we didn't have the, the, the whole uh, genome sequence and blah, blah. Now, uh, if the question is, uh, did someone imagine a way yeah, to prove that yeah, this... Are, I mean, there are, I don't know how many different sequences there are, right? How would you imagine during the experiment? Yeah, so the question is, uh, is did someone imagine uh, how to prove that the 70 percent are, are functional? I don't think anyone did at this point. Come on, we know that most of it is not functional because most of it is not under constraint. Well, that's not, the, that's not right. I think that's not the right answer, and I have a, a slide at the end to... What do you prefer to... Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. No, 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 we can have discussion. I don't think it's the right answer because if you take, if you take only the constraint, the evolution constraint, then you will say that only the coding part is, uh, and, and then you will, and then you will conclude that there is absolutely or almost no difference between a mouse and a human because it's 99.9 percent the same genes. Right. Okay, right. so you have to admit that a zone without constraint plays a role in this. It's not in fact big difference between a mouse and a, and a human. <coughs> Biologically, I think negligible. Invisible only from our perspective, so big. I think objectively, so. Why, why it's a big difference? Well, why say it's a big difference between a mouse and a human? I, 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 the difference is not big, maybe, but it's the, it's the, it's the most important. Hmm? We do not have whiskers. No, no, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the feeling it's a little bit more than that. <laughs> actually, you know, actually, Ma Misha, you know that mouse is not a good model for most of the diseases because the mouse does not behave. 
like the human. Okay. Okay. Different, but it's not more, less or more complex. Yeah. I mean, it's that different. Oh, no, no, no. So to say the same more or less, you need to have a measure. What you right. mean exactly. less, yeah. what you mean right. more. Yeah. 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 When you yeah. have this yeah. uh, measure, then... Uh, the, the, the only point that can be said is that a mouse is different from a human, but genomic, I mean, if you take the gene, the enzymes and all that, they are very, very alike. The so worries say that it's not different. I mean, the, the question, uh, what we emphasize, it's appearance different, but there's as biology. No, it's not only the, uh, the appearance. Even biologically, the mouse is different. If you take, for example, the, the, the lifespan, a mouse lives no, no, two it's years. Parameters, it's the number of parameters. If you look, be ten parameters, even there are thousand parameters and different than each other. for me. For example, one parameter the size. Come on, it's not big, big, big. You get big, big, and small. Right? Yeah, so they are very. Another, another part. Another parameter is the, the thinking that the mouse doesn't have at this point. <laughs> or oh, maybe yes, <laughs> but not the same type of thinking. Okay. Not yeah. the same type of thinking. We tend to overemphasize humanity. I think just uh, our perspective is distort the view. That's my point. Yeah. You think about ourselves. No, what you're saying, it, we, no, what we say, you're saying is that we are animals, and I, I think that's absolutely <laughs> correct. But then there are many differences. And it's not only ma the mouse and the human, it's also, uh, again, the, 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 the C. elegans worm, you know. It's completely different. I mean, and, and, and there are many, many genes which are in common. The, uh, actually, the coding sequence of the ma or genes of the, uh, the the mouse and human are almost identical. Yeah. Uh, that's actually the, a good point because uh, the what is not uh, uh, what is very diverse is the non-coding exactly. region. Exactly. It's my last slide, actually. It's my last slide. <laughs> Let's move to the last slide. The one that could determine theoretically what is a mouse, what is Exactly. That's my last okay. slide. Maybe we can skip the last slide. <laughs> okay, so what we can think is that maybe a non coding RNAs may keep the memory. Uh, they, they might be in the, in, in the cytoplasm of the, of the maternal DNA or they might be associated with the, with the, um, with the um, uh, sperm DNA, whatever. But they can keep maybe the memory of these epigenetic marks. And then we come to the last slide. <laughs> um, so there are, there are other open questions. So non-coding RNAs represent 97% of the genome. They are thus a huge molecular reservoir to explain yet unexplained functions. And there are many of the functions which are not explained by genes, simply by genes. Also, and that's exactly the, the, the point of the discussion, uh, in contrast to protein coding genes, which may, may be very similar between the different species, non-coding RNAs are highly variable. They are not submitted to constraint from one species to the other and from one individual to the other within the same species. That they have the potential to uh, play an essential role in the differences between species and in, in the difference between individuals within a species. Yes? Uh, I just want to talk to, the, to your point about the coding regions being the same. That's like saying that the in the human, the eye cells are really different from the cells on your hand, right? Like a difference between a mouse and a human, but it's not has nothing to do with the different coding regions. It has to do with the way how the coding regions are regulated, right? So yeah, yeah. But in total, I mean, yeah, but this difference within an organism. But in total, if you take the, it's like a, I would say the, the, the well, whatever. Uh, in total, if you take the human and the mouse. Uh, they are, th and the genome in total, they are not identical, but very similar. Yeah, but it's not about the actual sequence. It's about what is being, when is being transcribed when. Yeah, no. the timing, the yeah. timing no. of expression might be different. But actually, the non-coding region can regulate the expression of, of the coding region. Of course. So because the non-coding region yes. is of different, course. It could determine the difference in the expression. Of course, but, uh, but my feeling, it's only a feeling, of course, is that the non-coding region doesn't do only, I mean, I, I, right now we see it through the eyes of the genetics and the coding sequences. Everything, again, comes back to the coding sequences, okay? Everything is due to gene and protein. I don't think this is the case. And I, I have the feeling that the, 
the, the non-coding RNAs, they, they play a role in the, for example, in the brain functioning. So you started with the difference between different cells in the same organism, yeah. with brain and whatever other mm -hmm. cells got. Yeah. And yeah. This, about that, we already, as biologists, we call it development. And we have the answers already in the genome, because we have the description yeah. factors and the enhancers. And we have, I'm not saying well, all, so but we are beginning to, yes, I, I just wanted to make a point. So we are beginning to understand it without looking at a non coding. Mm -hmm. We know at least one example exists mm -hmm. that it is a uh, functioning, Involved. so there will be more. Although we don't know how it works, but uh, we, we, we know. Don't. <laughs> no, but I mean, at least we know what it does. So you are throwing at us 97% uh, of the genome to us biologists to figure out how we are going to figure out. You know, out but the question is, is a good question, of course. It, now, if we, it, now, if we think, no, no, uh, I don't think that the whole development is, is, is uh, due to, to the genes. And, and if you take the example of the microRNAs, they were absolutely unknown. Sure, sure, <laughs> and so we didn't even think that these things were working. So. I wouldn't be so. <laughs> yes. So one point that we can add is uh, not completely true that uh, they are not under constraints because uh, in different species they keep the same uh, position in some chromosomes and yes. seems to be related to these uh, chromatin organization maps that are... Uh, the sequence is, is, is under less constraints. And, but they, and, they are, and there are differences in the non-coding genomes. There are parts which are more... Uh, uh, common or more uh, concerned, and, and parts which are less. But there are some, as it, their chromosomal uh, organizations seem to be concerned mm -hmm, across mm -hmm. species and have maybe some functions, at least for part of them, to, to this chromatin. Yeah, yeah they, they, what you're saying, if I understand it properly, is that there they, they can be common functions between species for the non-coding RNAs, and what I'm adding is that may, might also be species-specific functions or even individual specific functions. Yeah. So, so let's suppose that you make an artificial genome where you get rid of all the, all the everything yeah. and you only have the open reading friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> where would happen? I don't think any, but maybe we should do it. <laughs> but I don't think that the cell will, would lie. Yeah. I don't think they, they, they are trying. Yeah, the the mechanic, the chromatin will not form without the chromosome. No, 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 I didn't say that. I said ah. that you get rid of this bits of so you make you make only one small chromosome. <laughs> you make one small chromosome with a coding sequence. I think actually very. Uh, how you, no, but the way it's organized, the chromatin in a particular shape. If you need this mechanically, yeah. No, 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 no. no. So what I'm just saying is what he just said. You you convert a human being into a yeast. In other words, there are no introns. But I'm not sure that human cell will live. How do you know that? Well, we, sh we have to try. We have to try. We have to try. Because, because the rest, because the rest of the cell has been, no, because I think, I, I, I'm not saying that it, I'm right, okay, it's just what I think is that the rest of the cell has been uh, uh, designed, but not designed, but I've been, uh, has, has evolved to work with a complex genome. And I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure that, uh, that if you take, but it would be an interesting experiment to do, but. I think actually, um, my, I have a kind of provocative question. You explain us about epigenetic marks, which connected with like chromatin, blah, blah, blah. And now you say about non-coding RNAs, and of course the third question, how you think, you suggest, the interplay between them, well, how this non-coding RNAs I, I, can be involved? Yeah, I didn't go into the please details. Go, yeah, yeah, go. I didn't go into the details. But for but example, the exist. But this is the most interesting No, no, part. but the exist RNA modifies. Yeah, the exist RNA modifies the epigenetic marks on the on the on the chromosome on the X chromosome, which is inactivated. Okay, so the the, the, the and, and there are other examples of that. So the the, the non-coding RNAs they had the, the, the capacity to the modify the genetic the epigenetic mark, but I don't think it's the only way they work. That's my <laughs> point. Okay, <laughs> let's go. No, I need you, you choose you whom you want. <laughs> you did not speak of plants. Yes. I think it has. Uh, well been shown some couple of years ago already transmission <coughs> to up to eight or ten generation in Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis. I, I'm not I'm not a plant specialist, I have to no. say. You know, <laughs> 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 yeah. No no. Mm -hmm. What did yeah. you show today? 
mais euh, épigénétique, euh, transmission, mm -hmm. euh, Vincent Collot, euh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The History of Unknown, mm -hmm. it made a big uh, uh, jump in the, in the literature. But uh, so I, I wanted to know what is uh, since these. Uh, but, I, but the problem is. I'm well, the problem in plants, I don't know if there is that this erasement of the, of yes, the you know, epigenetic exactly. marks. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not a plant specialist, so I, have not, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I, I, know, I know in Manal it appears, it, it, it occurs, but... Uh, so, a, a few comments. So, first of all, in your experiment of getting rid of most of the genome and seeing what happens, that's been done in nature several times. So, for example, the the puffer fish has a genome which is 100 times smaller than other fish and humans, mm -hmm. and it's still a fish, okay? Mm -hmm. So this, this proves that most of the non-coding genome is not required to make a fish. Okay? Or this fish. Um, so why do we study one? all this? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but I, hey, hey, stop, please, please, if, no, no, I, if I may comment, make a comment, uh, if the evolution constraint is so strong, and we don't need this 97% of genome. Why is it, has it been kept during the evolution? This Please. Is, this is population <laughs> genetics. So, so <laughs> ge genome size is not a correlated to complexity in any way. Um, genome size is to do with the strength of natural selection. So species which have very small po effective population sizes have very big genomes. So plants, humans have a very small effective population size. We went through a bottleneck in history. This is why our genome is full of rubbish. Okay? This is very well understood. Yeah. Um, bacteria, fungi have very effective, very large effective population sizes, very strong natural selection. Mm -hmm. Every single base pair is under nice. selection and has a, has a fitness cost when you do something. So this is the... It's a theory. Actually, wow. it is not co absolutely correct because uh, it coming back to plants, in plants it is well known, for example, if you cut half, at least half of non-coding genome of... Uh, Arbidopsis, non-coding part. Which cup? <laughs> creates a normal plan from this uh, story. But this is only in plants, and maybe only in Arbidopsis. But this is very interesting thing. But maybe it is like somehow connected with the case that in animals we have much no, less plasticity than in plants. No, he just made know. the opposite point. Pardon? He but just he made the opposite point. He made the fish. This is a fish. Move. That this is a natural experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can feel yeah. what you said. Yes, yeah. so you agree. I so agree. Then, I agree. Then, 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 <laughs> then, then I agree. Yes. <laughs> but it is not. But I don't know about animals. I don't. I He's know telling you. About the, the same. The same. The same thing happens in animals. You have very different genome sizes for animals, which are very similar to each other. So the genome size is not related to complexity. You don't need most of the. But genome. you say about comparison, and I say about experiment. It is not the same because comparison. <laughs> Still don't don't say the the oh, okay, actual that's result. Brutal. Okay, but they the actual they result agree. You can't agree, 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 agree. They agree with each other. Yeah. Man, continue. Yeah. And the other thing is is also this measuring which bits of the genome are important. So there's two ways we can do this. One is by conservation during evolution, and this estimates that roughly eight percent of the human genome is under constraint, as in it has been under selection during primate evolution. And the other one now is because we have so many sequences of individual human mm -hmm. genomes. Um, we can measure the allele frequency, the frequency of the mutations at every base. So the, the human population is large enough such that every generation we're doing saturation mutagenesis for the human genome now. So somebody is born with a mutation everywhere that is, vi that is compatible with life. And through sequencing um, millions of genomes now, we know the frequency at which you get mutations mm -hmm. in the population, uh, polymorphisms within the population these days. And so we have... But you, when you say sequencing, the whole genome or only the... Exome. It's mostly exomes, but becoming the whole genome. And as this gets bigger and bigger, then we will be able to measure exactly how important every base of the human genome is. So this is the other way to answer your experiment. It's like we will have the numbers to do this to say this base is exactly this important for the for fitness in within. But again, again, this is not taking into account the individual differences or all the you know. So maybe maybe this base is uh, very important in general, but this other base, which is only present in two people, <laughs> is the one base which makes the difference between these two people. Of course, exactly. Of course. exactly. Oh, excuse me, with what that said, I don't understand where this ninety-seven percent uh, figure comes from. Then. How do you know that ninety-seven percent? It, it's yeah, I, I don't I didn't do the experiment myself, but uh, but it's the the, the percentage of the, of uh, DNA which open reading frame of sufficient size to make a protein. Because what what I heard is that like eight percent 
has been shown that has some... Uh, well, it depends on the species. So in human, it's 3%, three, it's three percent, but uh, in other species, it's more. So it all depends on... No, the but the 97 is definitely not all non-coding RNAs. <coughs> this is your point. A lot of it is... <coughs> a, a lot of what? It's non-transcribed non at all, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, of course. Well, I, I, at least there are, there are parts of the genome that we can not even sequence properly. So, I mean, of course, we cannot know if they are transcribed or not. So we'll never come to 100%, of course. Uh, so, so why are you also focused on the genome? There are many more molecules which are passed from one generation to the next, and I'm sure you've thought about germplasm and uh, glycoconjugated mm -hmm. proteins and whatnot. I'm just curious to know. You know, they, they, you know, they might be part, but at, at some point you have to remodel the genome because after, if you take after the erasement of the marks, at some point you recall the marks, and you start with a stem cell, which is a blah blah. blah. And, uh, and so uh, glycoconjugate, if they can induce the modification, the epigenetic modification in question, yes, why not? But at this point, it has not been proven that any sugar uh, influences the genome. So, I mean, the, the structure of the genome. Did anybody ever do an experiment by microinjection of uh, uh, long non coding RNAs into a yes, that mm, yeah, ah, in fertilized eggs, no, no, and to show that they actually affect uh, not yet, not no, yet. but people have done so. Studies. How do we know they're important? It's all correlation, it's an open question again. It's not, a, it's not, <laughs> it's not a demonstrated so why fact, can't we do the experiment? yeah. She <laughs> wants us to do it. She is just suggesting an idea. <laughs> exactly. Anik is not. A, yeah, yeah. she is just coming up with an idea. She That's is, it. <laughs> you know? I totally agree that this is not proven. But there are many. That, but there are many examples of uh, uh, RNAs, non-coding RNAs, which, which are uh, modifying the genome. The exist is one, and there is a, another one which is very interesting. Is the paramecia? The paramecia has two nuclei: macronuclei and a, and a macronuclei. And uh, the micronuclei is, uh, has actually the whole genome and is very condensed. It's like uh, the, the, the storage of the genome. And, and the, the other nuclei, nucleus is, uh, is very large. It has uncondensed DNA and it's the part which is expressed. And uh, during the division, the cell division, uh, the m micronuclei will give rise to a micro and a macronuclei. So the, in the macronuclei, the, the, the sequences which are not expressed are deleted. And this is directed by RNAs. So there are examples, many examples but actually. Paramecium. Sure. <laughs> no, sure, of course. <laughs> but it is exactly in paramecium that you have the heredity non-DNA. Non hmm. Oh no, but, yeah, but it's... Thomas it's Sonnebaum. Hmm. That's exactly his whole life. No, no, but I, I'm not talking about the, the way the, the, the... I'm not talking about the genetics of the animals. I'm talking about the molecular... Uh, I'm talking about... The mechanism. About okay. something which is different. Yes, independent. of course, but the molecular mechanism exists. That's what I'm saying, and okay. In C. elegans, it was demonstrated. Yeah, of course, in C. elegans also, yeah. Yeah, it was shown genetically. Mm. But in mm. a way, microRNA is not so... So uh, well applicable now as an example of non-coding uh, of this long non-coding RNAs because they yeah. have their genes they are transcribed yeah. as a genes but not protein genes they are still not this junk or black yeah but those are not protein gene either it's non not a protein gene but they are not on the other so but they have their um, uh, they are just right. Yeah, they have a strong association are between long yeah, yeah. coding RNA and, and, and disease. Yeah. And disease. Mm -hmm. For example, in cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And it, it, in, uh, I believe in diabetes maybe as well. But no, no, no. In cancer, very well. Right. There are several long, right. long. Yeah. That, and these are those which are really looked at now. But 50 percent are coding from this long, long coding. 50 percent can code for microproteins. Right. So, yes, yeah. that's that. That's right. But it has not been proven that these yeah, microproteins. No, no. Some, no. some of these uh, microproteins are very it's, important. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm aware of that. They're very small polypeptides, very small peptides, actually. Yeah. So it's not proven that 
uh, they they have any function at this point. But it's yeah, they are, they are part of part of this encoding. Uh, they have very small open reading. Synthesized, many of them are not synthesized. No, they are synthesized and they have a function. No? Well, the function is not for sure. Yeah, but they are synthesized. Yeah, they are synthesized. They synthesize all the obtained from the long, the long, the by digestion. Yeah, if they, if they are very small, they can come from. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but one reason also why they are studied is because in different tissues, long RNAs have the same uh, expression pattern. So if you take a liver or a neurons, you see the same long RNAs expressed in the same tissues. So this is well also one reason why they are, uh, at certain point, they try to understand what they, what is, uh, what they do in the, in the cell. Because there are kind of uh, reproducible expression patterns for these uh, long RNAs. Mm -hmm. In also in healthy tissues, so. Well, but that's a correlation, and also it can be it's because, a because <laughs> yeah. of the different types of transcription factors that in the different tissues. Right, yeah. they 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 have yeah. to they yeah. seems to be uh, under some regulations. So. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay, so uh, we can take one last question. Do we have one? No. no. Everybody's hungry, I think. Everybody's hungry. <laughs> <laughs>